Ai, tēnā tātou, ko Hayley Milne tōku ingoa, heuri tēnei nō kaitahu, ko au te tumuaki o te kura nei o Kia Aroha, ko au tērā. Kia Aroha College is a designated character school. We are currently year 7 to 13, just been approved to become year 0 to 13 next year. So our designated character sits with 12 principles which are all about culture and language and identity, whānau first and making sure that our young people, our sort of motto if you like, is developing warrior scholars where young people are confident in and who they are and what they are and their ability to contribute to their whānau and to our community in the future. So the guts of our kaupapa is all about critical pedagogy, is really growing young people fully aware of what's going on around them and then giving them the tools so that they're able to do something about it. Our learning programme for this term or last term was actually about teaching our young people what it is and what their obligations are as tangata tiriti and also as tangata whenua and what are the differences in those roles. Our school has a Māori bilingual unit, a Samoan bilingual unit and a Tongan bilingual unit and so all of our young people choose to be part of one of those learning language programs and one of the things that we discovered was our Pacifica young people really excluded themselves from Te Tiriti or Waitangi and just assumed that was a document or a piece of legislation that really only speaks to Māori and Pākehā. And so for lots of our Pacific young people, they didn't really know how to participate in that. And then we discovered that lots of their ideas and some of the things that they said and some of their lack of understanding around why we should be promoting te reo Māori, why as young Samoan and Tongan people they should also be learning te reo Māori. This whole notion of fairness and how come it's not fair that Māori get some things maybe before they do. And so the whole learning programme was unpacking what does that look like, what are those responsibilities, what are those obligations, so that we can think about future generations of Pacific young people people who are growing with an absolute understanding about the need for Māori to be able to do things and the need for Pacific to taihua ake sometimes and it's just been a completely different space. We assume that adults know about that and our discovery was that actually we don't know about that in a way that then creates enough confidence to be able to do something about it if they see racism or whatever it is that then they've got enough information to be able to say hang on a minute that's not fair or that's not okay or actually also recognizing the contribution that Pacific people have made to the journey of Tiwi Māori so getting people like the Polynesian Panthers in to talk to them about why that whole movement came about what their obligations were as Panthers then and then the challenge that our Pacific students are taking on this term is how are they going to be the Panthers of today and what contribution are they going to make to our society to make sure that everybody understands that we all have a part to play and that there's no sitting around pretending that some things don't impact on us. That if, we, if we're going to understand stuff then the next thing we have to do is actually act on it. Yeah, I think that the biggest difference about our school is that we teach children and we don't teach subjects. So we're all about offering our young people the tools that they need. And if that happens to be chemistry, well, here, brawetera. If it doesn't happen to be chemistry, we can survive all the way through to year 13 without even worrying about that. It's really about growing adults who are understanding what is happening in our society and again what are you going to do about that. Too often in education we teach 
subjects which don't necessarily create any type of impactful person. As a principal of a school with a master's degree, I don't remember really much about how my secondary school learning has contributed significantly to my journey. But I do know that being a member of a whanau, being active on the marae, participating in the world are all the things that actually contribute to an understanding of what being critical is about and cr being critical, being a critical thinker and, and working in critical pedagogy doesn't mean that you just moan about everything. It's actually about what are we going to do about it and how are we going to change that. For our young people, being a 15 year old in Ōtara is an amazing opportunity but so many people reduce the young people in our community to being a product of poverty or all of the negative things that go with our community and so it's really important for us. We are growing our next Prime Minister. We are growing our next politician. We are growing the next person that's going to run the marae. We are employing some of our ex-students as kayako. And so for me, if we don't teach our young people about what their responsibilities are and what their obligations are to our community and, and to Te Iwi Māori and to Samoa and Tonga, because we're too busy being focused on what their English NCEA results are, then we've actually undervalued that child and their potential. So for me, it's really about the English and maths and writing pie. But as a parent, I want a child that's more than just a, I can read a book or I can count to 10 or I can write a couple of things. As a Māori parent, my child better be able to know how to behave at a marae and she better know how to dry some dishes and she better know that when she becomes a parent, she needs to be able to teach her child about those things too. Because just being able to read and write is just not enough. And so I think our philosophy and our kura is always about what else. Are we doing the best for our children? Are we doing the best for our society, our community, their whanau? And if we're not, then we're not doing our job because just teaching is not enough. I think one of the things for Māori and Pacific young people is that learning doesn't happen just in a classroom. All of us have been brought up learning from a marae type of situation. Our young people are fortunate enough that we have a marae on our site and they are all active kaitiaki of that space. We have kapahaka noho most weeks and when competition is in, we're going for gold. And yes, all of the learning that comes from kapahaka is important, but actually the bigger piece is that for most of our young people, they are urban Māori who may not be able to access their own marae where they're from. Some of them don't know where they're from, but what we're able to do is raise them in a marae environment where they know how to behave, where they know what to do, so that then when they do finally get the opportunity to go home, they're not strangers in their own space. They're not unsure. Now there's a whole heap of people who stand up and introduce themselves and apologise for not being able to do that in Te Reo Māori. And for me, our young people understand the journey of our language and the loss of it, and by participating participating in a marae situation, they're taking ownership and changing that, reclaiming their identity in the way that they act as well as what they know, so that you know when, when they're asked to go home or when they have to go home, they actually know what they're up to. I think another thing for us is that this year, we actually had one of our babies pass away on our site and his whanau asked for us to host his tangihanga here. And I think that for me, the honour of being able to host our baby's tangihanga on our school site really made it meaningful. It was such an honour to see our kids in here. It was such an honour to see our whānau in here. And so I think that sometimes there's a whole heap of academic reasons why we do things and none of that matters until you're actually able to host. And then not so long after that, we had the privilege of hosting another tangihanga here. And we've always hosted tangihanga. And again, the sort of school environment where tangihanga is not necessarily in the same environment. We're all about doing whatever it takes to contribute to our whānau, to contribute to the lives of our children, to teach our students in a huge range rather than just in the very small confine of a classroom. 
So one of the things that we think is special about Te Whanau o Tupuranga is the whakapapa that goes with that and we actually call it whakapapa. So with our year zero to six, one of our first priorities were people that had a whakapapa to Te Whanau o Tupuranga, that somebody in their whanau had to have been here before, whenever that was. So now we have babies who are enrolling whose parents are ex-students or whose parents have been here and I think that having the privilege of being here for 30-ish years, knowing who those people are, um, of the nine teachers in Te Whanau o Tupurudanga, 11 teachers in Te Whanau o Tupurudanga, nine of them are ex-students and so that whole journey of what being Fano looks like again is very different. I don't need to, on the first day of school, kids turn up and I say, oh, what's your name? And, oh, were you related to so-and-so and so-and-so? And And that whole connection of who they are and where they come from and who's come through before them is actually really, really important. And I think that too often at schools, we, we wonder why creating relationship is really hard. And it's because we miss the opportunity of, of whakapapa. And whakapapa to the school, is just as important as the whakapapa that they hold in their whānau. So we do that journey in a way that's a little bit different. Whenever we have whānau hui, they're actually not a whānau hui, they're really just a whānau get-together. And we sit and we chat. Things like our best way of communicating with our whānau is via Facebook. And most of the time, the availability, I don't know too many principals who have constant availability. If I put put my personal cell phone number on just about every single Facebook post. And when parents say that something happened a couple of weeks ago, I'm forever saying, well, why don't I know about that? Like, why didn't you tell me? Because we could have done something about that earlier. But I think I am part of this whānau. I'm not anybody special in this whānau, other than I might have done a little bit more years than some other people. But I don't participate in this whānau as a principal. I participate in this whānau as a whānau member. And I think that that's important. All of our young people, their parents, their aunties and uncles, their whānau, all participate in our whānau in the same way and the obligations that go with whānau. So I brought my baby back to school when she was four weeks old and she's lived her life here. She's now a kaiako in our whānau and she brought her baby back to school when he was two weeks old. And so that whole whakapapa, the babies being in our school, babies growing up in our school has always been a thing rather than it's not a safe place for a two week old person to be or you're not supposed to do that or there should be absolute lines around what these relationships are allowed to look like when I think that actually what they need to look like are inclusive so that our families are able to participate in education which is absolutely their right. They need to know what their children are learning and how do they participate in it. Which is also the whole experience if you like around COVID and our response to COVID was very much Fano first. So COVID happened and I said to the kids, okay, who's got internet and who's got devices? Nobody had internet, nobody had devices. So we bought them and we bought computers and we bought internet access and we provided that. We provide our lunches. We did that before the ministry project happened. It's about removing all the barriers and doing whatever it takes so that every person in our Fano is able to participate in the best way that they can rather than I can't participate because I don't have internet access or I can't participate because I don't have kai or I can't participate because of whatever reason. Our responsibility as a kura is to take away all of those barriers because life puts up enough barriers without there needing to be more just to keep people occupied. I think the biggest thing about inclusiveness probably also comes down to the way in which our school is structured in that young people come into Te Whanau o Tupuranga currently when they are year 7 and they stay here until they're year 13 and they know all of the kaiako and they know and they're in the same building and they grow and they know each other um, and from that is a whole heap of confidence and that's how whānau work. It's not normal for families to say you have now turned 12 and so you need to go off to auntie so-and-so for the year and when you turn 13 you need to go to uncle so-and-so for the year. Families navigate together from the time people are born to the 
time they're no longer with us. We don't normally send people off. We don't normally separate things like we do in schools. In fact, I don't know too many other instances where you separate in the ways that schools historically have separated by subject, by age group, by teacher. There's just a whole heap of separating. And if we think about the concept of Fano, that's actually really about bringing everybody together. It's not about separating. So the whole ability to do things differently in our school is really because we really understand what Fano is and we're not about we're not about separating. So again in terms of well-being, I just took five days off to go to a tangihanga. Nobody batted an eyelid about that. If somebody needs to take time off to go to a tangihanga, go on then. If somebody needs to take an appointment during the school day, go on then. We're all about that. And again I think COVID, our tangihanga that we've had here really teach us about what's important and what's not. And school has never been for us a nine to three situation and so if you can get an appointment with your doctor at two o'clock hi there do that because that's important for you and it's important for us because we need everybody to be as positive and happy and looked after and well as we can be and again I think our environment creates that I know that there are other schools that have a you have to be at school by such and such time and you're not allowed to leave until such and such time my thing with that is make sure that your own babies are at their places where they need to be first so that then you can actually be a hundred percent committed to these babies and maybe we try not to run the babies over on your way out the gate is sort of the only stipulation. If you work better at your house, then me mahi koe kei tōwhare um, when you're doing all your preparation and all of those things. Again, COVID taught us that the world still operates. And again, it was very interesting for us to see who the essential workers were, because that was our community. And for a long, long time, our community has been told that they're not essential and they're not helpful. <laughs> but when there's a global pandemic, apparently they are. Um, um, apparently supermarkets and truck drivers and cleaners and all of those things become way more important than other people. So it was it was actually a cool thing for us to be able to continue to do the things that we needed to do in an environment that worked. I think one of the biggest things about the digital space is that when our young people know about who they are and they already know about the impact of colonisation and how that shows up, then when we saturate the environment with laptops, devices, internet access, our young people are already asking questions. And so then when they said one of the online things about, oh, it was cool, I got to be at my whoever's it was, Tangihanga, virtually, and we just sort of sat back and watched the them have the conversation about what was okay with that, what was great about that, what wasn't so great about that, uh, because we'd already sown those seeds. I also think that while they didn't have laptops, our, our young people are young people and they know all about TikTok and they know all about all the things. And it's just an extension of what a learning tool is. As much as our whare is as much a learning environment as what our classrooms are, I think laptops, devices and internet access is, is just another extension. We have three and four year olds in our whanau that know how to use my phone and their e-papa better than I can. So again, it's normalising those things. But it is about letting our babies understand that this whole digital space is another wave of colonisation if we're not aware of it and if we let it happen. And the digital space could be another place that robs our language. It could be another space that takes our land. And so it's important for our young people to understand those issues so that then when they're presented with them, they recognise, oh, this could be an issue and I'll need to think about it. However, on the other hand, there was a whole heap of awesome things that happened when the digital space space became a given. Uh, corrections is not normally a place that's very forward thinking and when corrections had Fano visits via Zoom, it meant that young people were able to be connected with people that they weren't connected to just because of the normal access and so just those sorts of things was a really positive answer. 
I think our approach was more around attendance, around young people participating. Nobody died from not learning, but people were actually dying from COVID. And so for me, I think it was more about prioritising. And education is always going to be there. And yes, people are going to miss out on stuff if they don't come to school. But actually, they got a whole heap of cool things from being part of their whānau. The amount of gardens that have been created in Tamaki Makoto is mean. The amount of kai that our whānau are producing for themselves is mean. Uh, and I challenge anyone to say that that's not education. So I also think that turning up our tinana does not actually mean learning is going to happen. We could have a million children in school sitting there and not actually learning much. And we learnt that young people, their brains don't operate the best at eight o'clock in the morning. And so being more flexible with our time and being more flexible about what learning looks like and being more flexible about when and how you have to participate in education are probably the key pieces to attendance and actually making sure that school is worthwhile going because if you're not learning anything that you're interested in, no wonder there's some people not attending school. And so for me, we haven't had an issue with attendance because our young people are already really engaged in school and they all really, really want to be here and they can already see themselves in all of the learning programs that we're creating. And so they're away if they're sick and we encourage them to stay home when they're sick because that's what we've spent two years listening to every day on TV. And I think also we've got to be careful because we, we locked down our country because people were sick. Our school was actually closed for six months because while schools were allowed to open, that's when all of my staff got COVID and so we didn't have enough kayako. And so it was just one of those things. And so for two years, two and a half years, we've told people to stay home if you're sick and actually going to school isn't important because your health is more important and then all of a sudden we've opened schools and we've just expected that people forget about the messages that we've been giving them every day for two and a half years and be back at school. Another thing that for Māori and Pacific the messages about trust your local health professionals if that was true, we wouldn't have different life expectancy for Māori and Pacific people. And so again, it's very interesting that the privilege that exists in our country for some people is very, very evident. And our young people know that, that privilege doesn't always extend to them. And so I think it's very, very interesting that a particular group of society are now ready to open business and do all of the things. And so everybody else just needs to be ready when they are. I'm sure about that and those are not messages that we promote in our school if you're away you're away because you're at a tangihanga or you're sick or actually you just need some time at home and all of that is fine because when you come back to school whenever that is you're going to be ready and rearing to go and that's when the learning is going to be most acute and most beneficial and so I think again the different perspective is probably more important than how many hours is a child done in their school gates because I don't think that young people come to school and learn for every single second that they're actually within the school gate. Yes, to a point. When we're designing curriculum, we always come up with a big idea first. And that's because our young people are young people. And if they had their way, their curriculum would be eating. And so I think that as educators it's important that we come up with some big dreams and schemes and we present those dreams and schemes because of what's happened in the world or what is going to happen in the world or what's coming up. And then our young people then participate in how, what things, what questions do they have, what pieces of information is important for them, what pieces of information do we think as adults is important that they're not interested in yet. And they're very clear about telling us that. And that's great because that's being critical. I'm not ready for this information yet 
date or I'm actually not interested in it because I can't see how it affects me. And that may change in a couple of years time when maturity happens or a different something else is happening for them. But again, in education, we talk about not learning skills in isolation, but we do that if we ask young people for their opinion and then don't listen to it. So I'm always really, really clear about when we ask young people for their opinion, we need to be prepared to listen and to change what we were going to do if their opinion is that what we were going to do was boring or dumb or something. Because learning, in order for them to participate in their learning, they really need to connect to it. And if they're not connecting to it, then they're not going to participate. And it's really that simple. So I see lots of times schools asking for youth voice and I worry about what that looks like because if young people aren't confident enough to say this is dumb, then youth voice isn't happening because they're not they're worried about what's going to happen when they do use their voice. And there's no point talking about youth voice if that voice isn't also valued in their community because when your voice is only valued in your school or your classroom, then we've got some bigger issues. And when we're talking about youth voice, at the same time as we're grappling with issues of bullying and racism and poverty, and then I worry, are we actually really listening to youth voice? Or are we just making that sound like a good thing to do? Because that's sort of trendy, rather than really using our youth and our young people to really shape their futures. I think being part of a community in its wider sense requires us to participate in our community in all sorts of different ways. I'll also say though that sometimes our community is not ready and so sometimes our young people participate in youth adventures in our community and always feel slightly isolated because they do know who they are and where they come from and, and they're used to being in an environment where their opinion is valued and they might go out to something else and have a different experience somewhere else. However, I also think that it's important for our young people to be really clear about what's happening. So when Ihumatao was happening, we took our kids out there every day and it wasn't just to go there, it was to go and find out about all of the different points of view and go and make cups of tea and go and pick up rubbish and go and work that kaupapa because you don't learn about a kaupapa by visiting it. And so I think that that's also part of our bigger community is that if we're going to participate in something, we can't just visit it. So when we're participating, we're there, it's a long haul, we're going, we're watching it fall over, or we're watching it succeed, and we're able to participate in that. And I think that one of the bigger issues in communities like ours is that many people come in and do a little thing because that's great, but the kaupapa that are able to be sustained are the ones that are run for us, by us, and th those are the ones that are the most successful. Oftentimes, other people think this is what Aotearoa needs and they come in and they do a little thing and then they go away. And it didn't make any particular impact in a positive way in our community. So things like our Aotearoa Youth Squad and that our young people are able to participate in and see ongoing um, is great. But I also think that it's important for there to be different leaders and different times. And we've got a little bit of a saying about manutaki in our kura, where a flock of birds have a different leader and somebody goes to the back and somebody else takes over because that's how we keep ourselves fresh and we keep ourselves ourselves involved <laughs> and we don't get too tired because it's hard work being at the front of everything. So those are the sorts of kaupapa that we, um, you know, uh, philosophies and things that we think about in our kura. I think the biggest part that needs to go with assessment is what constitutes knowledge. So for me, uh, one of the biggest pieces of assessment that we did this year was watching our young people participate fully in a tangihanga. There was a whole heap of learning in that and a whole heap of identified outcomes that may not necessarily be directly aligned to a curriculum objective. And my challenge around assessment is always that actually it depends on what you're assessing. So when we're determined to 
to only assess against curriculum objectives, who said that the curriculum objectives were right in the first place? Because they're probably not, which is why we're doing a whole curriculum refresh. When we are hell-bent on testing, I worry about what that looks like because Again, if we use COVID as an example, the people in our society that are determined to be successful were not the ones that were at work in a global pandemic. They were the ones that had the privilege of being at home, being able to work from home, being able to be a teacher in five minutes and decide that teaching was a lot harder than people thought. I think those are great learning lessons and assessments and outcomes. Yes, we deliver to and exceed often the national norms in terms of NCEA results for our young people. That's not important. It's important, but that's not all that's important. In fact, we say to our young people, if all you've got is NCEA level three, that's not enough. What have you contributed? Well, how have you helped our community? All of those sorts of things. Because when we reduce young people just to assessment and NCEA results, again, it's not enough. If you have NCEA level three in university entrance, but you don't know how to do a whai kōrero, or you don't know how to karanga, or you don't know how to participate at your marae, or you don't know how to navigate your youth group at a church, then you're NCEA level three and university entrance doesn't mean much. Yes, that's important, but it's just not enough. One of the things that I find difficult in this school is always we're able to describe what we're not more than we're able to describe what we are. I think that it's probably best to say that yes, we're project based, but our projects last a term and within the term and within the project design is a range of curriculum outcomes. It's an integrated curriculum where NCEA standards are determined by what we're trying to achieve. So when we're learning about tangata tiriti and tangata whenua, then we're scrolling through the smorgasbord of NCEA standards and saying this history one might work here or this English one might work here or actually there's some tikanga Māori ones that might work here rather than here's an English curriculum that we all just need to do because that's what the course outline says. I think the planning cycle is actually not as bad as what people think it is in that when you're interested in what it is that you're teaching then you're interested in finding out what fits and where it fits. I know other colleagues who have a course outline planned for the year and the anxiety that they start to develop when they're coming up to an assessment or a learning module that they're not really interested in or that they know young people struggle to get through. I feel like we don't have that type of anxiety. If we're not interested in it, then we can guarantee our young people aren't going to be interested in it. And when we're really, really excited about it, we're looking, we're finding, we're creating, we're doing, we're teaching, we're learning, we're assessing, and we're moving on to the next thing. And that seems to be a structure that works. Occasionally, we might have a young person who says, I want to be a doctor. And we say, well, you're going to need some more science and we'll create a learning program particularly for the needs of that young person so that they can get the things that they want and do the things that they want. Our job is to facilitate all of that learning rather than prescribe what is necessary because it's more convenient for the teacher. Again, another key difference in our school around what constitutes a kayako is that if you're growing, you're a kayako. And as trained teachers, we should be able to access the information. I'm a trained teacher, I've been teaching for 30 years. I'm still not the world's best mathematician, but I know how to find out the information and work out the answers and teach young people how they can go about finding the answers, working through 
those structures. But what the biggest change in education is that young people are no longer vessels that our job as teachers is to fill. And young people are now in charge of their own learning, so they need to find the skills, find the tools that are going to get them to answer whatever problem it is that they've encountered. When we recognise that we're growing young people to do jobs that may not have even been created yet, and we're still trying to navigate an education system that was designed a little bit of a time ago for a little bit of a different time, unless we start doing things differently, and that is even in the structure of what constitutes a teacher. Because if we think about, again, the development of humans, your first teacher is your parents. And not all of us as parents have a teaching degree. And so how did we navigate and grow young people in their most vulnerable and most vital learning time before they've even hit a school? So I think that one of the big things in our school is that if you're growing, you're a teacher. And whether you are a trained teacher, whether you are an ex-student, whether you are a parent, whatever role it is that you play in our school, whatever job it is that you do in our school, a component of that job is being a leader by example for our young people and being a kayako for our young people. Even just in the way that we describe roles in our school, I'm a po whenua, my associate principals are Pohiwa. All of our kaiako and all of our students are called poako. There is no real separation of students and teachers because our students are teaching someone that's younger than them. Oftentimes, our students are teaching people that are older than them. Whenever I can't work out my phone, if I give it to a young person, they pull all sorts of impolite faces at me and tell me how easy it was to fix. It doesn't matter how old you are, you're always learning from someone that's older than you and teaching someone that's younger than you. So I think that it's really about the description of what roles people do. And I think gone are the days of you need to have a this or a that in order to be described as a teacher. I think one of the things that I will always challenge about specialist teachers, but I want us to remember that we are talking specialist teachers for young people in three years of education, year 11, 12 and 13, and then they go off to university, some of them not all of them and thank goodness because the world would be horrendous if every single one of us went to university so i want us to be really clear about prior to year 11 12 and 13 we're talking a general education and we're talking an education that is a life education and if there are young people who need specialised teaching, in particular NCEA subjects, we can access those people and we can access that information and we can access those courses. But I worry that we've become so focused on specialised subjects that we've forgotten about who it is that we're actually teaching. And we've forgotten about teaching the young person rather than you're only teaching this particular subject. When we have people employed in our school, you are a teacher of young people. You're not teachers of a subject because our young people need more than that. And, it, and I worry about the amount of teachers who describe themselves as a te reo Māori teacher because every single te reo Māori teacher I know is more than that. They're a parent, they're a grandparent, they're a son, they're a daughter, they're an auntie, they're an uncle, they're a member of the marae committee, they're a kapahaka tutor, they're a something. And what happens when we introduce ourselves, we reduce ourselves to some little, I'm a te reo Māori teacher. You're way more than that. And I worry that that's the type of lesson and message that we give to young people.
I think that one of the things that we have to understand about our current society is that it is very complex. When we're navigating issues around different life expectancy because of your ethnicity, when we are navigating issues about uh, predetermined outcomes, which can be connected to your postcode, when we're thinking about a renaissance of te reo Māori and identity on the back of years of law and policy that determined those outcomes. When we think about in 2022, there is still significant racism, then life is complex. And if we don't give young people all of that information, then actually it's probably more of a reflection on us as adults to be so naive that we think that none of those other things exist. And again, it's really the definition of privilege is that if it's not a problem for me, then it can't be a problem for everybody else. And so I think often, again, we underestimate the value and the opportunity and the amazingness of our young people by making everything nice. Because if you're a young person in Altada, it's not nice. Um, most of the time, it's, it's great but you're navigating some very, very, very complicated issues. And I don't understand why we try and protect children and young people from understanding those issues. We would be a much more powerful society if we had young people understanding how this came to be. If we understood why we need to have a renaissance of te reo Māori, if we understand why only 4% of Māori people are in reo Māori environments in their school, then what we get is a society of very critically conscious people. That's a great thing. If we were all critically conscious, we wouldn't have racism and we would have worked out a solution to poverty and we wouldn't have the inequity that happens in our country. But for as long as we're actually really about reducing everything to something simple, then actually all we're doing is promoting all of those societal issues because we're, we're not allowing young people to understand them fully. And then we perpetuate those same issues another generation and another generation and another generation. So for me, it's really, I, ca I can't get my head around why we would do it any other way. Because what we're producing is 250 kids who know about what they're getting into when they get out into society. We're not producing people to just stay in their own house. We're producing and developing young people who are going to be working in a range of different environments. And we are growing young people to be society's next generation of leaders. And we're growing young people to help create solutions for all of the problems in the world. We're not growing young people so that they can sit inside their house and not participate in the world. And so if we're not giving them all of the tools, then all we're doing is, well, we're underestimating. There's gonna be no change in our society ever because not enough people are gonna know that we need to do something different. I think that the biggest thing is that other schools can do exactly the same as what we're doing here. Our designated character could be the entire New Zealand curriculum. When we prioritise language and culture and we stop being forced to navigate a population of people who don't have any idea about what that is, and we're so worried about what society's norm or what the status quo is going to say. I think that the opportunity again that we're missing is the New Zealand curriculum, the New Zealand schooling system could absolutely be exactly like our Aroha College. There is no reason why it couldn't whether it's primary, whether it's secondary, if we did some fundamental shifts around what was important in education, actually really not that hard. The problem is that we're so historically located in school must look like this, 
that we, you know, we'd have teachers in an uproar, we'd have some principals in an uproar, and we'd have some communities in an uproar. But actually, just as much as there are communities in an uproar, principals like me that are very uncomfortable some of the time, teachers like mine who are very comfortable in the situation that we've created here, I really feel like if education was really about choices, every single school could choose to do it this way or not. And our designated character doesn't necessarily restrict us to, yes, we have to be different on purpose, but other state schools could also be different on purpose. And I think that until we're courageous enough to design education in different ways, to meet the needs of the children in our community, so that they can be their best selves and so that they can be the future solvers of all things that might even smell like a problem, then I think we're always going to have the same outcomes. Again, it's the definition of stupid, doing the same old thing and expecting different outcomes. It would be phenomenal if when we're talking about curriculum design, we, well, we actually stopped talking about curriculum design or redesign or refresh and we actually did a whole heap of looking at what our education system creates. There's plenty of options and plenty of opportunity. We're just sort of stuck and this is what everybody expects it to look like. And if we just fluff around on the outside, we're not gonna have any different outcome. And we'll have small numbers of young people who might have the 4% of young people that are in Kura Kaupapa Māori or the very small percent of young people who are in Kura A Iwi. The 250 kids that we've got here, the growing population of schools who are interested in what we we're doing and really want to incorporate some of that in their own schools, then yes, that number of people is going to increase, but it could be. The Ministry of Education just needs to tell everybody that they have to be like this, and then it would be very different. But I'm not sure that we're quite courageous enough to do that, but we'll see. We applied to become a Year 0 to 13 designated character school and when that approval came through, there is no additional building at this point because we have some space in our school. And it's been a bit of an interesting journey because people have asked how we're going to design this brand new school and there's a part of me that's a little bit concerned about that in that should I be designing a brand new school when really what I see and what our community sees and what our vision is, is that this philosophy is just as valid in a primary space and so we're bringing year zero to six children into our space, into our school, into our buildings, into our philosophy because their parents are a product of it and their parents have been asking for years for us to do this and so we're doing it because of the desire from our community, not because we're saying we think we should do this. Because of the lack of provision for te reo Māori in our community, because of the lack of difference and the lack of opportunities for young people to learn in this way, all we're doing is just adding more people to our whānau who were already in our whānau because their parents are already part of our whānau. When I looked at the list of the enrolments, I've watched those babies grow from when they were born. So it's not actually any major redesign or any major build. It's really just opening our arms up a little bit further and having children in our school who always wanted to be here anyway, but we were only year seven to 13. Then in terms of curriculum design for our primary spaces. The principles of our designated character are still going to be the principles that we abide by. We will teach reading and writing and maths. We're going to be Rumaki Reo environments, so our Māori, Samoan and Tongan classes will all be total immersion because again that's about identity and that's about just all of the things that make people awesome. And so I can't really see it being quite an interesting journey already because a number 
number of people are wanting to know what this profound difference is going to be and I'm sort of a little bit worried about it. In that it's not a profound difference, it's a what always should have been. So yes we've employed teachers who are primary trained and yes we've employed teachers who are experienced do maki reo, year zero to six teachers but that's exciting in terms of doing anything that's slightly different to what we already do. I think one of the things about the people who we employ is that over the last two years, just about everybody that we've employed has been an ex-student. And so no, there's no real induction other than me saying to them, why do the children in your class not know how to be warrior scholars? And they say, oh, you know, I forgot to teach them that. And I'm saying, well, remember. Um, so it's sort of, again, a whole different place when the majority of the people have grown up in this kaupapa. And we see that working in places like Kura Kaupapa Māori where their raukura go back to be teachers, go back to their to the kura to be teachers, and how different that is and how, again, much more connected it is. Our young people respect our kaiako because of their journey in Te Whano or Tupuranga more then they respect their kayako because they happen to get a teaching degree. The value of the whakapapa and the time that they have done in our whānau is far superior to the value of the teaching degree that they got or getting. And so I think that that's been an interesting development and it will be something that I will always promote but it's not an exclusive thing. If there is a kaiako who is going to sit in our kaupapa and appreciate it for all that it is, then they're very welcome to be here too. Our experience has been that we have had a few kaiako who have come with the idea that our kaupapa is what they were looking for and spent the time that they were here trying to turn it into something else so that they could understand what the kaupapa was trying to offer. And I think for as long as we're trying to be something else, then we're actually undermining what our kaupapa is as well. Um, we're not trying to be a kura kaupapa Māori, we're not trying to be a kura a iwi. we're just trying to be us because that's worked for our community. And people come and they visit our school and they ask what they can do and how they can take this and put it in their community. And I always say that this has been a 30 year journey. It's not something that you just do A, B, C and D and you'll be just like us, because you won't be. And there'll be parts about our kaupapa that don't suit other communities. And so I'm always very, very clear about take the bits that work for you and then add your own bits that are going to work for you rather than try and pick up this kaupapa. This kaupapa may not work anywhere else, whether it's just up the road or whether it's in a completely different community. This kaupapa has taken 30 years of a journey. And again, if you think you're going to pick up a kaupapa and do something with it in two minutes, it's probably not going to have the best outcomes, but I think that it's really about taking bits and pieces that work and do that, because that'd be great. The thing that society needs to think about is this whole definition of privilege. And if there are no Māori people in your community, choice, you do you, but don't get in our way of being able to do us. And if you don't want to learn anything about Māori and you don't value the land that you're walking on because you can't understand who has historical ownership and or if you don't really want to understand what's happening and what's happened in history in the legislation and policies of government after government after government again fine but the issue with that is that too many people then think that it's their right to tell me what i think and to tell me what i should be doing 
I'm really clear that we're just trying to do the things that we're trying to do because we know that that's good for our children and our community. And one of the things that I say to people too is that if you don't want to be here, then don't be, but get out of the way so we can get on with the work that we've got to do. And I don't mean here as in physically in the school. I mean, if you don't want to be here in terms of your understanding around education in Aotearoa, cool, don't be, but get out of the way. Because when you choose not to know, that doesn't give you the right to interrupt what I'm wanting to do, or what my neighbour wants to do, or what te iwi Māori wants to do. All that does is actually say you're, you don't want to participate fully in the opportunities that this can provide for us as a society. And so if you really want to bury your head in the sand, go for it. Just remember the biggest thing that people can do for the progress of education in Aotearoa is really to get out of the way. And you do what you want to do, but I should still be able to do the things that I want to do without being interrupted by what I'm doing doesn't interrupt anyone else. It just creates the opportunity for something different. And I think it's important that that's probably another message that even leaders of education, if you're not sure about doing things differently, okay, carry on doing the things that you've always done, but then understand the results. So what we've always done is privilege one group of people. And if you're clear about that, then fine, be clear about that. My concern is though, that we are not courageous enough to understand what we are doing and how we're participating and actually how we're perpetuating the results. And so if we are calling ourselves educators, then the first people that we have to educate is ourselves. And if we don't understand how we're participating or we refuse to see how we're perpetuating, then are we really educators? And if we are educating in the same way that we did 60 years ago or 10 years ago, then we need to look at ourselves because that's not actually good enough. I and mean, in fact, if we're educating prior to a global, in the same way we did prior to a global pandemic, we want to probably look at ourselves and work out what we could have done, should have done to change things because I don't remember the last time that there was a global pandemic and I'm semi-old. So I just worry that that when we don't move with society and recognise what we're doing, then I worry about why we would call ourselves educators because I don't think that that's a title that we should take lightly. And if we're leading education, then let's, let's do that and let's be clear about that because when we're leading education that is only about reading, writing and maths or we're leading education that perpetuates inequality or we are leading education that supports racism or contributes to poverty and contributes to unequitable health outcomes, then I'm sort of, I, I don't know too many people that would be prepared to put their hand up and say, I'm a leader of education that perpetuates racism. And so if we're not prepared to do that, then what are we gonna do differently? Because I think that that's the bigger issue is being really clear about what we're doing and how we're participating in it. And if we don't wanna participate in it, then what are we doing differently? Because I worry that we're not courageous enough to do anything different. So then we get the same results. Full stop. Mic drop. Wow.